Welcome. So this is going to be a quick overview of practical ethical and theoretical factors for the research methods section of the sociology exams. So what we've covered so far at this point, we will look to primary and secondary research methods, quantitative and qualitative data, reliability and validity in our methods, but and also positivism and interpretism. Now, a lot of these ideas and themes will come back up here. They are relevant. So do make sure you've looked at this stuff and you're familiar with these ideas before progressing with PET. So what is PET and the factors affecting choice of effort are, is what PET stands is all about. You know, it's looking at the practical factors, ethical factors and theoretical factors that affect the method you would choose as a researcher. So as a researcher, you come up with an idea, you want to study a topic. You would have to consider what we'd call the practical factors. These are effectively the ways you conduct the research. It's things that may affect you being able to do the research, the resources you need, the time you need. And it's really essentially the doing elements of a piece of research. You also have to consider the ethical factors. This is referring to the British Sociological Association's research guide and code of conduct. So this refers to the moral issues, the rules effectively of doing research and it is, as I say, the rules of research. And lastly, you have the theoretical factors. So this asks you to think about your particular stance, your position, your view, and this will affect your research and the methods you choose based on your theoretical perspective, your sociological point of view. And this is really about beliefs and influences and how these will change and shape the research you choose to conduct. So let's start looking at practical factors. Now, practical factors, there are a few of them. The first of these is time. Time is a massive influence when conducting a piece of research because the less time you have, the quicker you need your method to be. If you have long periods of time, you may choose more in-depth, more investigative methods because you have the time to do that. So, for example, a questionnaire is very quick compared to a participant observation, which is quite long. And again, the time frame you have will dictate the method you choose. Your researcher characteristics will also play a role in this. So, again, it's your characteristics as a researcher, your age, your gender, your ethnicity, your social class. If you are particularly trying to go undercover, you want to do participant observation. Obviously, your social characteristics will either be a barrier to that or it will help you engage in that investigation. So again, an adult researcher trying to study the experiences of children is not going to be able to do participant observation and blend in with the group. Access, as the name suggests, is, is can you get access to the people you want to study? Can you access the group you're interested in? This might be people on the street. It might be a protected group like children in a school. It could be people in a prison. So can you get to those people? Now, what we talk about is closed settings are settings where there isn't easy access. You can't just walk into the setting. And in these cases, you would need someone like a gatekeeper or a head teacher in a school to provide access, to open the gate and let you in. Money is also a big factor. This does overlap a little bit of time. Time and money tend to go together. So the longer a piece of research, the more money it will cost. The quicker a piece of research, the cheaper it can be. Questionnaires, very cheap method. Uh, as I say, participant observation is quite uh, a costly one. But also this does have bigger factors in terms of funding. Who is going to fund the research? Who is going to pay for you to do this research? And lastly, personal skills. So this is your skills as a researcher, your ability to conduct a piece of research. You need to be trained in these skills. So if you want to do covert participant observation, such as James Patrick of the Glasgow gang, you would need the skills to get into that gang. You would need a gatekeeper to get in that gang. You need time. You need research characteristics. So a lot of these personal skills overlap with one another. But the easy way to remember these time, research characteristics, access, money and personal skills you can use the acronym of TRAMP. So when you're thinking about the practical factors, you've got to think about your TRAMP. Time, research characteristics, access, money, and personal skills. Now, in addition to this, there are some extras. Questionnaires have low response rate as a practical problem of the method, which doesn't fit into TRAMP. Interviewers will have interviewer bias that leads to social desirability. Observations have observer bias, which turns to the Hawthorne effect. You also have issues like going native, getting in, getting out, with documents, it's authenticity and credibility. These are practical issues which don't fit that trap model, but are specific to certain types of research method. You've got sources of funding. 
who is going to provide the funding as we mentioned before and also your interests your values as a researcher i know this does kind of overlap a little bit with, with theoretical as we come to it later but also it might be that if you want to highlight a particular social problem um, so if you wanted to conduct research into environmental issues you probably would find more funding today than if you would try and look for the funding maybe 30 40 years ago the next factor affecting our choice of method is the ethical factor and again as we said this is the rules of conducting research now the first rule is deception now when you're conducting a piece of research you want to avoid deception deceiving people is not a desirable thing to do however in some circumstances, it is a necessary thing to do. So if you're doing covert participant observation, if you're conducting a lab experiment, there may need to be some deception in order to get a true reflection of the sample's views or the sample's behavior. But ultimately, you want to try and avoid deception as much as you can. The right to withdraw is giving people the ability to leave. So letting people leave the research and having no repercussions. And I want to jump to the next one because they do relate is informed consent. So all participants should be offered the right, right to refuse to take part. The researcher should tell them about the research, what is happening, and so they can make an informed decision. And that's the main thing is that sample are aware of the research. They have given their consent to be involved with children. Again, if they're not old enough to give their consent, you might need to get consent from parents or guardians. Now, I want to just highlight these three tend to overlap. Because if you are deceiving people as part of your research, then they probably have not provided informed consent. If they've not consented to be part of research or they don't know they're being part of research, they don't have the right to withdraw. So often these three tend to link that if you are deceiving someone, there's no right to withdraw. There's very often very little informed consent. If there's no deception, then there is the informed consent and the right to withdraw. Protection is as the name suggests it's protection from harm you are protecting vulnerable groups so that's you as a sociologist but also the group you are studying and last but not least sensitivity so sensitivity as a researcher you as a sociologist you'll be dealing with sensitive issues that could be abuse it could be neglect it could be some form of discrimination and these things could cause harm and upset people so it's being aware of these issues trying to avoid causing um, particularly if you're investigating topics like abuse or rape. Would have been very important in studies like Dobash and Dobash looking at domestic violence to be sensitive as they approach the topic. Now the easy way to remember all the ethical factors is what I use is drips. So deception, right to draw, informed consent, protection and sensitivity, your drip. So at this point we've got tramp and drips. Other observations um, or sorry, other ethical factors in observations, you have the guilty knowledge element. So you might have to engage in illegal activities. You may observe people engaging in illegal activities. Do you report those crimes and harm your research or do you allow them to carry on so you can observe them? There's also the risk of harm to the researcher. An extra one for ethical factors is confidentiality and anonymity. It doesn't fit the DRIPS model very neatly, but again, is making sure that the sample who take part in the information is protected their identities are concealed, um, particularly looking at issues which could be quite controversial or potentially cause harm to the, uh, the participants. And last but not least, we have our theoretical factors. Now, theoretical factors have broken these down into four things. So we have positivism, which is you may take the positivist approach. We know it's a top down, it's macro, it's structural in terms of views and particularly they're looking at quantitative methods. They want number data. They want to be able to see trends and patterns, observable facts. They like reliability from their methods. So this would be questionnaires, structured interviews, um, non-participant uh, sort of number-based or statistical um, observations where you're just tallying events. So for using sort of the, the Flanders model. Um, so this is what positivists prefer. Interpretivists, the, the kind of polar opposite, they're a bottom up approach. They look at individuals, they look at individuals' experiences, perspectives, views. They want qualitative data. And really what they want is for Steyen in their research. Um, so qualitative methods is the big thing. They want validity, they want for Steyen, they want insight, understanding, feeling and emotion. 
And just because it popped up very quickly, the other sort of elements to consider with this is that positivists prefer reliability and they also like representative data. Larger samples, often in questionnaires, allow the sample and the data to be more representative of the wider population. Interpretists, they want that validity and for Steyn. And again, this is about your view, your perspective. So the easy way to remember this is pick. Now, just talking about positivism and interpretivism and how it impacts on research. This is going to influence your choice of method. If you are a positivist, you are more likely to choose methods that will be quantitative and reliable. If you are an interpretist, you're going to want that validity for staying subjective insight. So you're going to choose methods that will be more likely to produce those. And on the table here, we've got a slight like comparison of where some of the methods would fall. Often with most methods, they are going to be more valid or more reliable. They're going to be positivist or interpretivist. Now, that's not to say that a positivist can't use unstructured interviews or an interpretivist won't use official stats. Um, but often there is this sort of leaning towards particular methods because it provides the type of data that is preferred. And again, just a very quick summary, it was in my last video, but this, this overview of the difference between positivism and interpretism there for you to take a look at. So last but not least, how do you remember all these factors? Now, as I said, I have an acronym and my department use it. It's uh, PET. So we have our sociological pet here on the left, so our little sociology pet. He is dressed as a tramp. He's dripping sweat. And although he's not doing it right now, he's picking his nose. So the easy way we remember this is our pet tramp drips pick. And again, this provides the, the basic practical, ethical and theoretical factors for writing these questions. It's not exclusive, all of them. There are additional ones, depending on the method. But sometimes there's a good basis of your writing, just if you're ever struggling, tramp drip pick to help you remember that. Okay, thanks for watching. I hope this has helped and uh, hopefully see you again soon.